Welcome. Jo- thank you for joining us, everyone, for the Deer Talk Now podcast. I am Dan Schmidt, your host. Uh, thank you for joining us once again. I don't know what number this is, but if you're listening to the podcast, thank you. Uh, just like and subscribe to those platforms. Or if you're watching the video version, please like and subscribe to those platforms. I'm not going to list them all for you. They're at deerandeerhunting.com. And today we have a familiar name, but you might not recognize his face. This is uh, Dr. Matt Ranella. Uh, brother of Steve Ranella, you probably know him, Meet the Meat Eater podcast and TV series, etc. Matt uh, marches to his own tune. And Matt, thank you for joining us for Deer Talk Now. Glad to be here, Dan. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Now, we got to meet each other. I was a, a guest on your podcast here a few weeks ago. And one thing that I'm going to ask everybody to do after they listen to this podcast is go over to Matt's podcast. It's called the Hunt Quietly Podcast. Matt, um, just explain for our listeners and viewers the premise of your podcast, how you came up with that, and what is your um, goal in having this podcast? Uh, I, you know, how do I even start? So I have deep concerns for the future of the kind of hunting I care about, which is high quality, non-pay, publicly accessible hunting. Uh, I've been hunting for 40 years. Um, More than that, if you want to include chipmunks and squirrels. (laughs) And there's never been a period in my life where the quality of publicly accessible non-pay hunting has improved. It's only been on a downward trajectory. More and more land is that has been developed. That's certainly true. Uh, but also more and more vastly more land has been leased up. And I think that what we're coming, becoming and will become uh, we will adopt, and we are adopting, a European model of wildlife management, in my view. I think that we are abandoning the North American model of wildlife management. I think that that's the way the future of hunting is going to go. Uh, but I thought I would take a little time, take a few years, whatever it takes, to point that out to people and try to um, conceptualize some solutions. The solutions would take a revolution, in effect. They would take a a dramatic shift in in the way hunting hunters look out for other hunters and maybe laws, but I'm not focused on laws. I'm trying to change hearts and minds. Um, And I don't think it'll happen, but I just wanted to put out a a view of what it would take to save publicly accessible non-pay hunting. So let's talk about your background a little bit first, Matt. Um, What, I, I know what you do, you're an ecologist. What does that entail? How long you've been doing it? Where do you do it? And just a little bit of that background. I work for, uh, I got to be a little bit vague because I'm supposed to get like press release, um, uh, clearance when I'm describing my, talking in an official capacity. Uh, so I'll just, I work for a federal agency as a, as a research ecologist and not representing myself professionally here. But what I do is I work on primarily on trying to restore degraded grasslands, like grasslands that have been invaded by weeds or that have been impacted by surface mining or oil and gas um, drilling, those sorts of issues. So we, uh, I also do a lot of work on the CRP on conservation reserve program lands these days, in particular trying to get wildflowers to grow on those lands to support pollinator insects because pollinator insects are in global decline. Those are the sorts of things I work on. Those are the sorts of things you work on. You live in Montana right now? 
And I yeah. believe you're yeah. originally from Michigan. Yes, I am. And oh, and how long have I been doing it? I've been, I've been, I've had this position I'm in for about 20 years. 20 years. Okay. So I, I'm familiar with your brother's work. Um, he came up through the ranks. I had been here, oh boy, probably for 10 years already when he came through the ranks as a writer and he's basically gone on to stardom with his meat eaters. I don't want to say shtick, but it's, uh, um, the TV show, the podcast, I know you guys are opposites. Um, your, I guess your, um, mission statement could be summed up in three words. And that's according to your own website, depublicize, deglorify, and demonetize hunting. I'm talking about deer hunting specifically. I know you, you deal with other things, elk and, um, probably antelope and other things, but, um, Let's go through those one at a time, Matt. When you say depublicize, what do you mean by that? I, I, uh, I mean, do away with using hunting as a source of entertainment. Um, and I mean, so and what I mean by doing away with that is I mean, I'm encouraging people if they really care about their hunting if they really care about publicly accessible hunting to disengage from it um, because if nobody's looking at it, it'll go away. And I also am encouraging hunters to unfollow if they're on social media, hunters that and personalities that post dead and dying game animals on social media. My reasoning there is that I think of all of that stuff as free advertising for people that want to commodify land where game lives, um, hunting property. And in my view, this is just a thought experiment, um, but I'm committed to it. And if it turned out, if, if you could convince me it's not true, and this is a lot of what we discussed, you and I, Dan, on the podcast, that I, I'd be mute about hunting but i believe that this free advertising is the leading destroyer of access uh where i live through the through the 80s i'm told from my friends dads into the 90s and even uh, even somewhat when i moved here in the early 2000s access was pr pretty good it used to be it used to be outstanding you could hunt all this ranch land around here in the in the mid 80s um just by banging on the door and i think it would still largely be that way if it wasn't for hunting television and and hunting social media um i think that they have those the hunting tv hunting social media are a primary cause of privatization of hunting opportunity in in the u.s in you know any and even the media outlets themselves um, seem to favor uh, a, pri uh, a privatized model. They, some of the nonprofits, uh, like uh, what is it, the Deer Association, they write articles about how to find your hunting lease. Meat Eater writes articles about how to find your hunting lease. The Turkey Federation writes articles about how to find your hunting lease. Um, Onyx writes articles about finding your hunting lease and now the owner of Onyx, um, even though he had this project landlocked where he was showcasing landlocked land and the, all the landlocked land, public land in the Western U.S. is now he's, he's bought an outfitting company. He's, he's outfitting 17,500 acres of landlocked public land here in Eastern Montana. It seems like the industry media social media, hunting TV, they are all engines for privatization of wildlife, in my view. So you're basically saying your brother helped ruin hunting as you know it. There's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of, of hurt feelings there. And, um, and so I'd rather not direct. Well, you know what I mean? You, you, I, I didn't mean this. I didn't mean to pit this. He's among a, a very large number of 
of people that I think have, maybe you like, maybe people like the, the, maybe they, maybe I'm open to the idea people value hunting culture and hunting entertainment more than they value hunting themselves. And maybe a lot of people consider it progress that now areas where uh, the local, the, the local hardware guy or the plumber or the gas station attendant got to hunt um, along with, you know, maybe 30 other people on some ranch uh, that now it's one guy from one wealthy guy from Minnesota. Maybe they, maybe they consider that progress. I do not. Yeah. Um, and we've, we talked about this and you know, we both dis, we disagree, uh, disagree on this because you you kind of i think lump television social media everything into one and i and we're going to get to this but i i know where you're coming from but um i grew up hunting in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s up until now back in the 70s and 80s we didn't have deer we had cottontail rabbits and i didn't never had to knock on a door to go rabbit hunting ever that changed in about 1985 and it had nothing to do with media. It had nothing to do with TV. It had nothing to do with anything that land prices were going up and up and up and people didn't want you on their land. And um, I equate the same thing to deer. Has deer hunting become more popular? Yes, because we have a lot more. We have deer now. Uh, we didn't have deer where I grew up in the 70s. If you saw one, it was like the talk of the town. You saw a deer. Now you have, we have 32 million deer. I just looked this up, by the way. 32 million deer in America today. There were 40 million deer when uh, settlers first arrived here. So we have as many deer today as we did ever. And we didn't have that in the 70s. And I, I would say there, that's a direct correlation as to why you see increased privatization. What do you, what do you think about that? Uh, deer and elk numbers were pretty good <clears throat> here in the here in the in the 80s um that's one thing i think um i get little tidbits uh like i'm looking i get to i only get to see any of us only get to well no there's people that see more i only get to see through a very very tiny peephole and even through that tiny peephole i have people calling me up and saying or, te or i have them on my podcast or emailing me and telling me things like i got into hunting and leased hunting land because of watching Steve Rinella on the Joe Rogan or listening to Steve Rinella on the Joe Rogan experience. I came to Montana and went on a, a, a hunt with an outfitter on leased land for elk. It was my first hunting trip ever and I got the idea from watching Meat Eater on Netflix. You know, the, so like these things are very difficult to quantify, but um, you know, I, I, I guess the way I do it is I imagine what I, the world would be like if there's a bunch of media hype around hunting. And what I imagine is that the, the most difficult thing to get access to and to be successful as a hunter is good land with with abundant game. So I imagine that what, what I'm going to see is that the price of access to land goes up. And then I go and look and see, I get a little bit of evidence. And sure enough, that's what the evidence suggests. So I agree, Dan, it's hard to run the counterfactuals. What would hunting in America be like today if it wasn't for hunting tv and hunting social media and um i don't know another thing i think is so you you could be right i could be wrong about all this stuff i'm open to that but another thing i think is i, I look at it to, to to argue that media hasn't made access to land more expensive in my view is the same as arguing that advertising somehow doesn't work in this domain unlike every other domain um I mean, you look at what happened to military enlistments after Top Gun came out. They went up fivefold. So did Ray-Ban sales. Look at what 
happened to bow sales after Hunger Games or any other um, other number of examples. I think showing punting without any mentorship, without any like without any indication of how you're bad you're screwing the local guy or the person that can't afford it. Um, now, no one on these TV programs is saying, you, you know, they'll they'll say nebulous stuff, things about conservation, but they'll never say, you know, share. Um, so there's been there's been a, a, a shit ton of advertising and promotion of hunting, and no no instruction or no about like the importance of sharing. So what emer what emer what's emerged seems to me to be a consequence of media. You know, I, I, you make some good points there. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that I would also, I guess, argue is that, okay, I'm, I'm going to just bring out a couple numbers for you because I hear this all the time. We talked about this the other week, but I hear this all the time. Public land hunting sucks. There's not good quality animals. There's not good quality experiences. I have no place to go. That's the biggest one. I have no place to go. So I'm going to use two examples. I'm going to use my home state and I'm gonna use Montana. So Wisconsin has 5.2 million acres of public land and 640,000 deer hunters. That's 15% um, of Wisconsin's forested land, which is like 30 some million acres. 15% is available to public land hunting. So looking at that, I could say, yeah, I mean, if you don't own land or you don't get access to it, it's a pretty tough road, right? But there is 5.2 million acres. <clears throat> Let's look at Montana. That's the one you bring up. 30 million acres open to public land. 32% of all land in Montana is available to public hunting. And here's the caveat. 640,000 deer hunters in Wisconsin, 140,000 deer hunters in Montana. So what I always look at people is, and I wrote about this many, many times over the almost 30 years I've been here doing this because I grew up hunting public land. I told you about that. I grew, I did it for 20 years, almost exclusively. I had no place to go. Nobody would let you go. If you, they did, there was always some kind of BS, you know, I didn't want to deal with it. Um, you're behind the eight ball on public land. Now, is it, am I going to be able to go out and kill 140 inch deer? Not unless I really work hard, but if I want to work hard, there's plenty of land available and to my next point, which would be my next question, I, I know one of the things that you say is that, um, and I think you're a little bit of a maverick in that regard. You, you say we don't need to be um, uh, stressing recruitment as much as we do. I don't think we should be recru recru uh, stressing it at all. I, uh, okay, so I guess a question to you is why why do you, why in your view do do we need to be doing recruitment recruitment is because i view hunting as a lifestyle i do not view it as a sport i view it as a lifestyle that is just as good and you know honorable as teaching uh, your children how to farm if you're a farmer or garden if you're a gardener hunt if you're a hunter fish if you're a fisherman um to me it's it's getting kids away from screens. It's getting kids outside, good, good, clean activity. And at the end of the day, you're bringing home. The one thing that I agree 100% with the meat eater guys, I don't agree with everything they say, but is that taking responsible for your own carbon footprint. I went out this weekend. I spent one shotgun shell and I had dinner and that was on a rabbit. I never, I didn't get in my car. I didn't drive anywhere. I, I uh, made that rabbit up with vegetables I grew in my own garden. For me, that's why we should be recruiting people. Is everybody going to be like me and do that? No. But I think if you teach one kid, like Ted Nugent, when he had his camp for kids for decades and decades and decades, they would bus inner city uh, Detroit kids out to his place an hour west of Jackson, Michigan. And he would, these kids had never, ever put their hands in the dirt. And that was teaching them the, the wonders of the natural world. And that's why I think the recruitment efforts that we see, are some of them the best? No, but at least people are trying to. And are you going to create a hunter for life? I don't know what the percentage is. It's probably low. 
but you're educating those non-hunters as to the wholesomeness of this lifestyle. Okay, that's cool. Um, that's that's a noble reason. So you, because there's other reasons um, than the one you put forth, and yours is the best argument, in my view. Um, your argument is that ma- making people hunter make hunters makes them be better people, or be, or 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 happier, more people. in tune. Yeah, yeah. I, that's the most virtuous reason there is. I mean. Well, there's other ones. Um, the other main ones are to protect our rights. With we want to recruit more hunters to protect our rights, which I dismiss on its face because um, there's no there's no hunting bans at all in place in New Zealand where 1.5 percent of the population hunts. There's uh, one ban in Canada right now, um, where three percent of the hunt, of the population hunts, and there's two bans in the United States right now, where five um, percent of the population hunts. So as the number, of, the percentage of the population that hunts increases, near as I can tell, the number, the amount of controversy and bans increases. Um, it's more more people putting controversial stuff on social media uh so i dismissed that one that it's good for that it, that that it, we need more hunters for 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 conservation i dismiss that one um there's a lot of data on the effects of hunting pressure on wildlife everything from uh from stress hormones in ungulates to lipid storage in ducks to spatial distributions in ungulates and the which has effects on uh on the forage quality they're exposed to litter sizes birth timings so i dis, um, i dismiss the idea that we need more hunters for conservation well, let, me stop, think, let me stop let me stop i don't you think on, the elk would agree with that let me stop uh, you on that, on that so, point but you have the best one and i want to get i want to get okay. i want to get yours but okay. go, go ahead no, go ahead. Yeah, your your idea is the best one, if you're going to make that that case. But uh, in in my view, I mean, if you look at the literature on on crowding and hunter hunter satisfaction, crowding is an enormous barrier to satisfaction. Even the R three literature itself says that crowding is a major problem. Um, but are we talking so, Montana? Or are we talking national? No, no, no. The, the, there's a 700 page the uh, shoot. What is it? The shooting sports. The yeah. what's the name of that organization? NSSF, the National Sports. Yeah, Sports they, they, have, they have a 700 page uh, home devoted to R3. It was came out in 2017, and if you read the survey data in there, you'll find that crowding is a top issue um, in their in their own survey data. So they, this book is devoted to try trying to help our three practitioners uh, overcome obstacles to getting more people out hunting. And the biggest obstacle is that there are too many people out hunting. And I think that there's other way, other things that are that other ways to be. Thank God, other ways that you could be a fulfilled human being. We should be doing uh, soccer recruitment because if soccer gets too crowded, you build another soccer field. Uh, I just don't believe that there, I don't believe in R3 because I think the three R's are are internally contradictory. You're either R2, which is recruitment and reactivation, or you're R1, which is retention. Uh, because if you incre- if you're successful at recruitment and reactivation, it comes at the cost of retention yep. because people are frustrated about crowding. So you're either R2 or you're R1. I mean, that's just the way it is. And I just happen to be R1. Yeah, and, and, R, and the first R is what again? Retention? No. Recruitment. 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 Yeah. 
trying to gin up interest in hunting and get more people to do it. I, you know, the, when I look at the numbers, and you're probably familiar with Warnke's studies here uh, in the Midwest, which basically showed the historical trends of hunting. Basically, you had the large influx of um, recruitment from just say 14 to 25, and then you had the your your meat, which was 25 to 45 year olds. And then once they got to 50, they dropped off the map. And we actually ran that story. Charlie Elsheimer wrote it 20 years ago. It was called Why They Quit After 50. But if you look at those charts now, retention is small. Retention uh, numbers are a, a fraction of what they used to be. The middle ground is about the same. But the people from 50, uh, now they're 60, 70 years old, and they're hanging on. And he said, and rightfully so, by 2030, which is only not even 10 years from now, you're going to you're going to drop off a cliff because you're going to have these middle-aged people nothing coming up behind them and you're telling me which i disagree on do we need it for management we absolutely need it for management we have 32 million whitetails what are we gonna are we we gonna like populate every state with gray wolves now i wouldn't like that Uh, i don't think a lot of people are gonna like that no I, i i wouldn't say that we don't i don't that i wouldn't say that there's not a need for hunting for management. I don't. I just don't see a need to. I don't see a need to increase the size of the hunter population. And if you look at who's saying we do, um, it's all people that make more money when there is more hunters. Um, that's what's unique about what I'm doing is that, unlike. I guess I have a tiny, tiny bit of a voice now, like a bit of a platform. Um, And like, and and I'm, I'm not even being, I'm not even being um, like, there was kind of a gag order on me. I would write magazine articles and, and they would tell me they're going to publish them and then they wouldn't and things like that. That that even seems to be lifting someone. I'm actually going to the, to the Pope and Young banquet in, in Reno and, in april and talking there so i have a little tiny bit of a voice out there now and but mine is the only one that's saying we don't need to recruit more hunters and i don't think it's a coincidence that i'm also the only one that isn't making a penny yeah which i'm losing a lot of money actually (laughs) Um, you're probably I have just... no mechanism from der- for deriving income for what I'm doing. None. Yeah, I know that. Um, which which I th- I find interesting. I what I what I try to wrap my head around is on some of the things. All right, let's go through. I, I, let's just go through a couple things here. Let's talk about nonprofits. Okay, um, Pope and Young's a good example. I think they're a great organization, but they're a, they're a nonprofit, right? That that they're promoting um, recruitment. They're promoting more hunters. They're promoting more bow hunters. They've actually, they've been the most flexible group out there that I've seen. They've actually changed some of their ways on the ways they thought. Um, I don't know about, much about them. You know, I have prescriptions for all this. I have nonprofits that I'm back. We, there's a, we have nonprofits that we now back. One of them is for Progeny. It's a startup like, nonprofit in Texas with a guy who's trying to crowdsource fund the purchase of hunting properties. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Montana Hunters for Access. And what, you can check them out at montanahunteraccess.org if you're interested. What we do is we have a program here called Block Management, and it allows public, uh, it, 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 it reimburses large landowners for allowing public hunting. And the program's under threat because of leasing and because of this of these companies like land trust that are competing with it. Um, so what we do is we raise money and to buy like calf shelters and feed fence closers, that sort of thing to as appreciation gifts to try to encourage people to stay in the program. And we also work at organized work days to go out and fix fence and things like that. And then the third nonprofit that I support is Howell. Do you know about them? Mm-hmm. So what Howell does is they are like an early warning system. They they make hunters aware 
of bills that are pending in in the legislature uh, that concern the hunting community, so that the hunters can show okay. up and kind of like sportsmen's so, lines. Yeah, but I, I I don't I don't know a lot about Pope and Young. I I, I don't think I probably like them very much. Their keynote speaker this year at this banquet that I'm going to is uh, John Dudley, who I think is among the people that are horrible, horrible for hunting. He he killed something like we have on our on our hunt pile the Instagram page. I can't remember exactly right off, but he killed and put on social media something like 14 big game animals this year, like four elk, two moose, etc. I think that that's perverse, and I think that th- that those are the people that are the next generation of hunters are looking at, and I think it's disgusting. What? Like he just and put the hunts up there. No, he put the dead animals up there. That's what he killed this year. Fourteen, something like that. Well, I put dead my deer up on social media. Fourteen dead. I, yeah, we just can we can agree to disagree. Yeah. I think any hunter that's killing fourteen big game animals a year, five elk when success rates on elk is ten percent. I think it's grotesque. I think it's extremely selfish. Was it just photos or is it video? I, I don't know this guy. The fact that he killed them the that fact- many animals is perverse. The fact that he had to gloat about all of them and use them to sell products on social media is even more perverse. So and he's and he's somebody that's like that we're supposed that's what 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 is being modeled to the next generation of hunters. And I think that that's I, I think that that's incredibly alarming. Are you familiar with the Bomars? Yeah. So what do you think about that whole situation? Um. It's just another example of what happens when people use hunting as an instrument to develop a public persona for themselves. It, it, it all, I mean, so many of these guys have gotten caught poaching. Mm-hmm. Like, I could poach the rest of my life and not get caught, you know? So, yeah, the fact that, that, that there's, we've talked about the, all these cases on, on my podcast, that there's 10 or 12 in cases of hunting personalities getting caught poaching in the last decade is demonstrative of just how much they must must poach because like i say i could poach the rest of my life and not get caught easily if you got 10 12 cases of these people getting caught can you imagine how much poaching that they're they're, they're getting away with it must be insane and i think the reason that is is because once you're killing for content um there's this urgent need to to generate as many carcasses as possible so people um resort to dubious means Matt. okay everybody we're going to take a quick break we're going to thank one of our sponsors today's episode of deer talk now podcast is brought to you by scent killer gold laundry detergent with power boost plus from wildlife research center Featuring ultra-concentrated, odor-fighting power and ultra-premium dirt and stain-removing powder, Scent Killer Gold provides twice as many loads per ounce compared to regular Scent Killer laundry detergent. I use this stuff year-round, not just for hunting season. I have allergies. This stuff is hypoallergenic. It's scent-free. I use it on all my clothes. No, I don't smell like a GQ guy when I go out or anywhere. But Scent Killer Gold Laundry Detergent really helps me, and it's very economical. You only have to use that little cap. That's it. One little cap of that stuff, an entire extra large load of laundry. Pull your clothes out, smell it. There's not going to be any scent there at all. It's pretty incredible stuff. Take your scent elimination to an extreme level by looking for those gold caps. Wildlife actually owns the copyright on the color of those caps because a lot of other competitors have been trying to rip it off and have their packaging look like scent killer gold get some at your local sporting goods dealer or check it out at wildlife.com um there are always going to be a case of bad apples you know there's always going to be a case of and if this could be hunting or it could be anything it could be uh baseball with steroids i mean if there's something there's always going to be people taking advantage of that i think there's a lot of good um we kill a bunch of deer. We put them on social media. We try to educate. I'm not saying I'm holier than thou, but I'm just saying that 
we'd use it in the right means and we're not the only ones i see i've been doing this for a very long time actually before television was even around on uh on the larger side of things um so i see a lot of good and the, the question i wanted to ask you is and we kind of did this you know me i, I kind of go off in extremes but i said let's take a, a magic wand and say there was no hunting media we got rid of television we've got rid of social media we got rid of all these things that are evilizing if that's a word um hunting who's going to be there to help promote the good because i see there's a there's a lot of good um that's coming out from uh from television and social media and other other ways of who people who are doing this for a living uh yeah i don't know what the effect of getting rid of all hunting media would be but i, I think it'd be negative it, it just it just should have been if we were it should have been calibrated in a way that had the best interest of the hunting community in mind aren't we doing that though we we, reg we regulate ourselves don't we um the the hunting the hunting not the community hunting. not the community because with social media anybody can chime in now and say i think you're an idiot i think you're you know you're a moron for doing this i mean i think today more than ever more than ever we're accountable i i feel sorry for the millions of hunters in this country that don't engage in any form of hunting media and what this has done to them so I, a calibrated media that like a, a media that was fine-tuned to do the most good for the most hunters would be one that informed the hunting community of issues that of concern to them conservation access chronic wasting disease what have you um they wouldn't there would be no spot burning you know like like that is pervasive um the best deer hunting in is in blah 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 this year and all that like because i feel sorry for the people that have hunted there their <laughs> and i just life. i just gave up their backyard yeah yeah um so it, there'd be no there, i don't see any benefit of showing dead and dying game on the computer uh, or the television um to the greater hunting community certainly not to people that the hunters that just like to hunt but they don't they're not engaged with it in any way um but i think so, i mean i think showing dead game which for the most part i mean we talk about there's distasteful stuff out there but showing it is i i guess i'm weird because i see it as a celebration a celebration of not that i conquested this or that or it's a celebration of life is the way I look at it. And I know, like I said, my view on that is probably skewed. I know some people look at it as like, this is some kind of uh, accomplishment, quote unquote trophy. I hate the term. Um, I don't view it that way. I view it as like, hey, congratulations, Matt. That's an awesome deer. Even, no matter if it's a six pointer or a 12 pointer. To me, it doesn't matter. It's like I put myself in that situation and say, wow, that must have been a magical moment for you. And I'm down with that with friends and, and family, but I don't see the need to show the entire world anybody willing to look on a public social media account or on the TV. Um, you, 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 like people need to be edified by strangers for shit they shoot. I don't, I just doesn't see, it seems perverse to me. That's a, that's a good point. I can't, I can't argue that. Okay. Let me, um, I, there's so many things I want to ask you, but, um, let me ask you about chronic wasting disease. What are your thoughts on it? Uh, I I haven't followed the issue closely. I, I know enough to be alarmed. Um, yeah, so I'm not I'm not very well educated on it. It's, it seems like it's going to be with us a long long time and um, forever. And I don't know what, what the long term tra trajectory of it is. Yeah, my point has been if we're going to spend million, number one, if Ro if Rome is burning, where are the fire trucks? And, and that's not just testing; um, it it needs to be research and real research, uh, not just saying, "Hey, we got it over here now." It should be research on what does how is this disease work? Blah 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 blah. Not enough of that. And number two, um, it doesn't infect humans. So where's the research on that? <clears throat> and we've talked about this until I'm blue in the face. 
Um, so that's pretty clear now that you could you can eat a deer that has it and there's no worries about it. Well, there, there's no there. It, let's just put it this way: there is no evidence that chronic wasting disease affects human health. Okay. There's no evidence. So would you would you eat a deer that you knew that tested positive? I would because I well, I wouldn't be cutting through the spine, but I'd eat the okay. meat. Because okay. so, somebody else asked me that, and I said, "Well, would you eat a strawberry that you knew was treated with paraquat?" And they're like, "What's that?" I'm like, "It's sprayed on every strawberry in California, and it <laughs> causes and it causes cancer." Yeah, it's a known right. effect. And they're, "Oh, you're just being you're being, being sensational." I'm like, "Am I? Am I really? Right. You know, right. it's this right. weird scare factor." Ooh, okay, it, you know, well, I'm learning right now. It's a know. brain disease that could affect you. Okay, but it doesn't, does it? Well, no, there's no scientific evidence. So, so where's the, like I said, so where's the fire? And everybody says, well, you know, it's 100% fatal to deer. Okay. You know, I'm, West Nile virus is probably 100% fatal to robins. But, okay. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, yeah, but, this is interesting. But yeah. it's, anyways, it, it gets me off on a tangent that we could go off on. Um, let me just end by asking you, we kind of went around the circles on this, but hunter ethics, what would you like to see cleaned up in America? Just oh, um, by, un, by hunter ethics. question. <clears throat> so my biggest, my biggest concern with, with bad, poor hunter behavior is its impact on public access to private lands. Uh, this block management program we have here a lot, there's been a lot of property lost to it over the years because of uh, people surface shitting and uh, driving on muddy roads, leaving the gate open, that sort of thing. I mean, it's a huge, huge problem. It's, a, it's, one, it's another reason why people go with the outfitter. It's like, well, I don't know how to deal with, if, if there's a problem, I've got one guy I call, you know. Uh, I, I've been advocating with our state legislature to i believe that if you're going to hunt land public land made accessible private land made accessible through government programs that you should have to take like a, a, a compulsory ethics class uh, and I mean, I think this is relevant to other states because other states have these programs. Ours is the biggest by sh far, but you know, South Dakota has plat plots. Uh, there's, I just found out there's some little program in Wisconsin. Uh, a guy was telling me about, can't remember the name of it, but I, I, I think that if we could expand those programs, there'd be a glimmer of hope maybe. Um, but yeah, like I, I think that the biggest problem for me personally is when poor hunter behavior leads to locking up the lands. That's what I'm most concerned about. What do you think of that? And I agree with you. I mean, that's why you see, I mean, that's why we saw uh, private lands closed 40 years ago because you can't police our ranks. There are guys, forgive my French, there are guys that are just assholes. They, if they, you, yeah, you let yeah. them out there, they drink beer, they throw the cans on there, they don't shut gates, they litter. And then, like you said, the landowner's like, screw it. And now, especially in the West, like you said, okay, I only have to deal with this one guy, and normally the outfitter is some guy he grew up with who saw an opportunity. Right, you're right. You know? yeah. And yeah. he's like, no, nah, I'm just going with Bob. He's got all my land, and you got to deal with him. And he doesn't have yeah. 20 guys knocking on his door and let, you know, his cows get out or something and he's got to deal with it. Um, I, Here's what I don't get, Dan. Like, let's say you're just genuinely a disrespectful person. Like, you just don't care about other people. Wouldn't you do the right thing just so you had a place to come back next year? Do you think they would? Do you think they would? Just for no other reason. You think they would? And you know one thing I, I, I one thing that really got under my skin because I was a diehard public land hunter. You know James Kroll, Dr. Dr. Deer from Texas. Um, he came up here and he he became our they called him our deer czar when uh, they needed a consultant. 
And he based one quote he had that just pissed me off till no end when I heard it. But I actually understand it now because I'm a little bit older. But he said public land is the last bastion of communism. And he was right because it was like the land sucks. It doesn't get managed. If it's the federal government managing it, they got to manage it for all these different reasons for carnaboo, butterflies, and other shit that nobody cares about. You know, hunters don't. And then if it's hunting, if it's, oh, you can go deer hunting there. Well, yeah, I can go deer hunting in the vacated Kmart parking lot too, but I'm not going to see anything. So I, to, to <laughs> me, it was like, it was, there's so much truth to it. So the, what I see now is I see as much as it bothers me too, because there's a lot of land I would love to hunt, but I can't afford it. And I, I shouldn't say I don't, I can't justify it. I can't justify paying $5,000 on the off chance that I could kill maybe a two-year-old buck and one turkey every year. It's like, no, mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. I'm not leasing land. Some guy's going to do it. Some guy from Milwaukee or Chicago or Appleton or Green Bay, they're going to gladly pay that. But then I'm just like, well, you got to pick and choose where you hunt. And that's why I bring up these numbers about public land hunting. Um, if you want to hunt, there's a million, I guarantee you, no matter where you live, even in, uh, not Texas. Texas has got, well, they got 1.6 million acres. Alabama has fewer, 1 million acres. I've, I've interviewed some people that hunt that land, and they kind of eke out uh, a life as a sportsman on, on, in Texas. On but public. you have to put it in perspective. I would love to drive a, a brand new Tundra, but number one, I'm not going to try to cost justify that. So I'm driving around a 12-year-old Silverado. That needs to get fixed because oh yeah hit a deer right and, there, but, and, um, and it is somebody like i just i don't have any i i would quit if i had to pay pay to hunt it just goes against the whole yeah. purpose of it for me like i'd rather kill a, a one-eyed calf with a limp on <laughs> on public land than some giant bull that nobody else can even get to and it's i do think it's it's much different regionally where you're living much different wyoming colorado montana no, I think it's worse where you live Way well, worse. access, or I should say, numbers-wise. But, like, land-wise, yeah, here's a million acres, but it's not, you know, there might be prairie dogs on it, but there's not, it, there's probably not quality whitetail hunting, you know, right. in, in a lot of areas. Right, yeah. But, yeah. okay, well, I don't know if we solved the world's problems, but we tried anyway. Oh, it was a great conversation. <laughs> a great well, I, lo conversation. I love doing it. I love meeting you. And, um, again, where can people go to check out your podcast? It's the it's it's called the Hunt Quietly podcast. You can find it uh, on all the major platforms: Spotify, Apple, etc. Uh, we also have the Hunt Quietly Instagram page as well. So okay, well, say hi to your brother for me. Tell him that I think bear meat is disgusting. Um, <laughs> I will eat deer over bear any day of the week. <laughs> all right, all right. Best Thank you, Matt. Man. I appreciate it. All right, take care. Bye. For Matt Ranella. I'm Dan Schmidt. Thank you for joining us. And again, please like and subscribe to wherever you're listening to this. It is the Deer Talk Now podcast. Um, until next week, you can check these out every Thursday or go to our YouTube page or our Facebook page and you can look at them anytime you want. Deer Talk Now. See you next time. This episode is brought to you by Drop Tine Spirits and their premium 12-point bourbon whiskey. The story of Drop Tine's finest bourbon starts with being double barrel aged. What this means is they first aged the bourbon in new charred oak barrels in America's heartland, then sent it to California to be finished in the salt air of the Pacific in the finest brandy barrels. Finishing their bourbon in brandy barrels was the choice of many trials to find flavors as unique as the Drop Tine deer. They wanted a bourbon that is not only warm to the palate, but it would sip smoothly and leave notes of fruit behind. They found the perfect brandy barrels in the Russian River Valley near Sonoma, California, and what they created is a bourbon whiskey that exhibits a sweet, floral, almost honey-like aroma balanced by caramel, toasted wood, brown sugar, and toffee. Twelve Point Bourbon is only available online. To get a taste for yourself after the hunt, visit droptime.com. Deer Talk Now is also brought to you by HuntStand and the new HuntStand Pro app. Let me tell you, I've been using the HuntStand app for a couple seasons now, and I can honestly say it has changed the way I hunt. There's no more guessing on wind direction, property lines, and stand locations. The app takes my hunting to precise new levels that help me be more successful. 
The new HuntStand Pro app unlocks unlimited property data on a nationwide basis, including detailed property boundaries throughout the United States and most of Canada, including property owners' names in the United States with detailed ownership information. You can also access detailed public land maps and search for properties on a county, state, or province level. There are so many features that also help you dial in on the best spots based on weather conditions. For more information, visit the App Store or log on to HuntStand.com. This podcast is brought to you by Cuddyback Cameras. I'm going to tell you guys, I've known Mark Cuddyback personally for over 20 years, and I've been using those cameras for over 18 years on Deer and Deer Hunting TV. The recent technology in the past few years has absolutely blown me away. And for those of you who don't have great cell coverage where you hunt, Cuddyback's ability to daisy chain from one camera to another camera with new Cuddylink technology is an absolute lifesaver. With the ability to connect 24 cameras, I place one home base camera at the edge of my property, swap that card out just once a month, and I get a look at all the activity on my entire property. My deer stay unpressured and the conditions are prime for opening day of bow season. For those of you who have the luxury of cell service, check out their new Cuddyback Tracks technology. This is game changing. For more information, go to cuddyback.com. Deer Talk is also brought to you by Traditions Firearms, a family owned business and inventor of the new Nitro Fire muzzleloader. When owner and president Tom Hall and his daughter Allison first showed me the Nitro Fire system, I was immediately impressed that it is not only more convenient than conventional muzzleloaders, but it is safer. The ability to quickly remove the powder charge is a big deal, such as when crossing a fence, climbing into or out of a tree stand, transporting your rifle in a truck or an ATV, or when hiking rough hills, wading creeks, or plunging through swamps. I've used the Nitro Fire on numerous deer and deer hunting TV hunts over the past two years, and I find it safe, accurate, and very dependable. The gun is available in numerous configurations. To learn more, visit traditionsfirearms.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Apex Outdoor Rewards. Hit record and win rewards. Enter the Apex Whitetail Challenge in your state for your opportunity to win big cash. Enter today and get a 4K camera absolutely free. That's a $300 value absolutely free. There are some serious rewards here, guys, so be sure to enter in your state. Who would have thought your next buck could be putting money in your pocket? Reserve your spot today at apexoutdoorrewards.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Full Range Mounting Systems. These mounting systems are a great way to manage all of your mounts in a stylish and organized manner. We are using their pedestal mount here on the podcast set for two shoulder mounts, and it looks just awesome. Be sure to check out all their mounting solutions at fullrangesystems.com. And finally, Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. Hey, if you've watched me on Deer and Deer Hunting TV, you know that I'm an equal opportunity bow hunter, and for most of the past decade, that has also included crossbows. In fact, I shot my first crossbow deer with a 10 point over 12 years ago. And to say that I've been impressed with their technology is an understatement. This year I'm shooting the new Nitro 505, the fastest crossbow in the world. It is light, compact, and includes the revolutionary AccuSlide cocking and decocking technology. Whether I'm in a tree stand, ground blind, or spot and stalk hunting, I know the Nitro 505 is up to any challenge. Check one out at a dealer near you or log on to 10pointcrossbows.com for more information.